And now, if you would please, join me in saying together our call to worship. Let us come together to worship God, the architect of all life. In peace and unity, let us begin our songs of praise, declaring, O Lord, our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Amen. Amen indeed. And now if you would rise as you're able for the singing of a processional hymn, number 648, we'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4. come before you this day to praise and thank you and ask that you be present with us today that we may be inspired, that we may experience the love, forgiveness, and mercy that you give us every day of our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A reading from the book of Psalms. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man? that you are mindful of him, the son of man, that you care for him. You have made him little lower than heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks and herds and beasts of the field and birds of the air and fish of the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This is our song to God. I thank you, to God. <laughs>
able for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the Church. Come, Holy Spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel of Mark. Glory to you, God. Jesus went into the region of Judea and across the Jordan. Again, crowds of people came to him, and as was his custom, he taught them. Some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? What did Moses say to you, he replied. And they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. It was because your hearts were hard. Your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law, Jesus replied. But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united into his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. This is the gospel of hope.
And will you pray with me, please? Holy and almighty God, we thank you again this day for rousing us from our slumber, breathing fresh life into us so that we may come into this holy place hear your word proclaimed once more, sing songs to your holy name, and now ask for our blessing this day, which is to know your will for us. So speak to our hearts, minds, and souls. And we ask this, of course, in the most holy name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 You know, I don't normally attach titles to my sermons, but if I were going to do so today, and I am, it is the Pope, the Clerk, and the Judge. Let's start with the Pope. I can't imagine there is anyone here who is unaware that Pope Francis visited the United States recently and how much his visit, his presence, seemed to affect people everywhere. The people who lined the streets to see him, the people who actually got to meet him, and the millions of the rest of us who watched him on television. I said last Sunday how much I admire this man, not only because of his outspokenness, on issues with which I can agree with him, but also because prior to anything else, this Pope exhibits a true holiness about him that seems to come from his heart and not his position. And because his holiness comes from something we all have, hearts, then we can all be holy. For holiness is not something reserved for popes, priests, preachers, or any one group of people. It is a quality instilled in each of us at birth when we are born just a little lower than the angels. Prayer is the thing we spoke about last week. How prayer, whether it be spoken or or silent or exhibited in our actions, it is prayer that makes all the difference in the world, all the difference in our lives. So the Pope comes to America, wows Congress, makes the strong cry and the weak smile, and for a few days the atmosphere seemed to change. And everyone was just happy. Something so many do not get to enjoy on a regular basis, if at all. Hearts were turned simply because one man came to visit and was not afraid to speak his mind. A mind of Christ. So what he says does not fit into our neat or actually very messy little political packages. He speaks a different truth. I read a great article this week titled, Donald Trump and Pope Francis. Two voices, one loud, one powerful. And in this article, these two men are compared to each other by what they say and do. And Trump, of course, says and does things that clearly show him to be a megalomaniac, which he doesn't deny. And he does things that are meant to deliberately attack other people and to offend at the highest level possible. So he says things like John McCain is not a war hero because he got caught. Or that Lindsey Graham couldn't get a job in the real world or that immigrants are unclean and unsafe for our country and need to be sent back to where they came from. And then they contrasted that with Pope Francis 
A man who, while on the one hand is trying to manage an institution that has gone awry over the centuries, and on the other hand seems to care more about people than those very institutions he's trying to manage. So what we hear the Pope say are things like, even if the life of a person has been a disaster, even if it is, it is destroyed by vices, drugs, or anything else, God is in this person's life. You can, you must, try to seek God in every human life. And then he also said, among us, who is above must be in service of others. And probably with a little bit of humor, he said, this doesn't mean we have to wash each other's feet every day, but try to help one another. And of course, who am I to judge? The Pope made quite a splash while here in America until last week. And the news began to come out that the Pope had had a private meeting with Kim Davis, that county clerk from Kentucky who has been making headlines and, believe me, a lot of money for refusing to do her job as an elected official because she reclaims religious objection to what is now the law of the land and the constitutional right of every person, the right to marry. I was so disappointed when I learned that this story was actually true. And I described my disappointment as my Pope buzz had worn off. I mean, why would he do it? What was he thinking? How could he display so many good qualities and say so many good things only to turn around and to support someone who is, embasing her, who is basing her life and her newfound fame on hatred and lies? And that's where the story began to pivot and eventually fall apart. Did the Pope meet Kim Davis? Yes. Did they have a private meeting, one her lawyer says was requested by the Pope? <laughs> no. She was one of dozens of people standing in a line as the Pope left the Vatican Embassy in Washington, D.C., did he stop and shake her hand and give her a couple of rosaries? Yes. Just like he did to every single other person waiting in their line for their chance to be in the presence of greatness. And what does Kim Davis, her husband, her lawyer, and all her little friends do after being in the presence of greatness? Were their hearts turned? Did they try to live more holy, more truthful lives? No. They decided to lie, to deceive, and to try to use the Pope for political advantage. Kim Davis's version of her heartfelt Christian beliefs seems to be predicated on lies and deceit. Ain't nothing Christian about that at all. And I hope we've seen the last of her, although I'm afraid that's probably not the case. What was extraordinary, however, was the length Pope Francis personally went to to debunk her story and expose her lies. He didn't know who she was, this woman standing in line with dozens of other people. Oh, and actually, do you know how she got there? Have you read that? To be in line at that embassy? The man they call the papal nuncio 
the Vatican ambassador to the United States, a man who has this position because he was exiled to the United States. Imagine that. That's where they exile people, to the United States. <laughs> it knocks us off the pedestal a little bit. You know, he was exiled here by Pope Francis for being a corrupt Vatican official in Rome. Didn't want him there anymore. And lo and behold, wouldn't you know, in his place of exile, he gets to take his revenge and embarrass the Pope by inviting one of the most controversial figures in our current society and helping get the story out about this private meeting that never occurred. Lies and deceit. Holy people. Lies, deceit, intrigue, revenge. All done in Christ's name. All orchestrated by a corrupt individual who is also virulently homophobic and a woman intent on making her millions by behaving as anti-Christian as possible. Well, the only thing I can say about it, this is thank God for the Pope and for not just leaving us all behind and not caring about our news stories on our television shows. Oh, one more thing. Did you see who the Pope did meet with? The only people who got a private meeting with him? His gay friends. No kidding. He had a meeting with an ex-student of his, a man he has known for 50 years, and his partner of 20 years, another man. And he knew who they were. And guess what? Unlike the mysterious photographs of Kim Davis and Pope having their private meeting, her lawyer still insists on saying actually exists, which of course they do not. There's actual video fo footage of the Pope and his gay friends. You can watch online in a number of different places video that the Pope himself made clear he wanted released. Well, in case you can't tell, I'm happy to say my Pope buzz is back on. <laughs> I can wear the cross still. <laughs> Except, it's not quite as high as it was before, for one reason. Remember, I said the title of the sermon is The Pope, the Clerk, and the Judge. Well, we've talked about the Pope, and we've talked about the Clerk. But who is the Judge? I have to say I'm not too happy with myself how quickly I jumped to judge a man just a week er earlier I was praising as the holiest man on earth. I'm not too happy with myself for not showing good leadership qualities by posting online and telling people here how my buzz had worn off. But what I'm most unhappy about is after surviving a lifetime of judgment from others, I was so quick to judge myself. And why? Well, I felt hurt. I felt betrayed. I felt angry. But most of all, I felt at a loss at how, once again, in the light of all the goodness that was being exhibited for a change, the church, the media, and the politicians would win once again on this gay issue. The issue that obviously slices right into my very being. I'm glad the man who does not judge went to such lengths to discredit the lies that were being told about him. And I'm glad that I once again can feel good about someone I really do admire. 
And I'm glad that he doesn't let the institution control him. But rather, he's actually doing an impressive job of trying to control that big institution. But ultimately, what I'm most glad about is not so much what's going on in the Catholic Church, but what's going on in the Metropolitan Community Church. A church which is a worldwide movement and phenomenon has been debunking lies, exposing deceit, and preaching the real gospel of love to peoples across the globe for 47 years now. I don't think it is coincidence that the gospel text we have this morning is the one that is used to denounce same-sex marriage or divorce or remarriage. I don't think it's coincidence that we have this gospel text when same-sex marriage is dominating the headlines the past couple of days when the world took that collective gasp when the clerk's lies were splashed all over the news. Well, that was some bad news. But here's some news I'd like you to hear this morning. The good news. The good news that we know is the gospel of Jesus Christ. A gospel that this morning has some religious snobs trying to trick Jesus into saying something that will only end up hurting someone else's feelings no matter what he really answers. And how Jesus, quick to realize their real intentions, lays out the fact that it is man who makes laws about marriage and divorce, and we should follow those laws. Sorry, Kim Davis. And how it is not our laws that define God's intentions. For God's intentions are clear through the very creation of humankind when we were created to be in partnership with one another, in relationship with one another, in love with one another. I actually quote part of this morning's gospel text in all the wedding ceremonies I perform when Jesus says what God has joined together, let no one separate. And like Jesus, I'm not trying to make any sort of statement about the rules of marriage or the rules of divorce. I am reiterating Jesus' claim that if two people have found love in one another and have decided to live out that love under the influence of God's Holy Spirit, then bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. God sees love. And you cannot regulate love with human laws. Hatred, on the other hand, can be regulated with human laws. Something we are too familiar with, I'm afraid, in our world. You know, there's actually a little bit more to the gospel story than what we read this morning. This particular story ends with, after what is actually this very brief exchange about marriage and divorce, Jesus goes on to tell his disciples to bring the little children to him. For it is to these that the kingdom of God belongs, he says. Truly I tell you, he says. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And then he took the children up in his arms, embraced them, laid hands on them, and blessed them. In other words, it wasn't marriage and divorce Jesus spent his time thinking about. It was the least of these. The children, the widows, the orphans. The neglected, the unwanted, the ridiculed. 
the cast aside, the poor, the hungry, and the sick, the prostitute, the sinner, the addict, the gay, the lesbian, the trans. These are the people Jesus cares for most. Those of us who know what it is to love and to be in love, but also to know what it is like to have love withheld and to be used by others to spread lies and deceit. Well, my friends, cast that aside so that as we continue our spiritual journeys this week, let us vow not to be so quick to judge, but to exhibit our spiritual gifts of mercy and care, reaching out to all of those who are in need of some good news in their lives today. Amen? Amen. Will you pray with me, please? Holy God, we pray for those who are suffering through sickness, through loss, without support, in loneliness. Bless them this day, O Lord. We pray for those who seek justice, who must live in places where evil presides and where they are systematically shunned and persecuted. Bless them this day, O Lord. We pray for those who feel like the smallest of the small, the weakest of the weak, who feel ignored and unloved. Bless them this day, O Lord. We pray for those who have been abandoned and abused, who have been neglected and left powerless, who have been limited and rejected. Take them into your arms, as Jesus did with the little children and bless them every day so that they are supported, liberated, loved, and accepted. In the name of the one who came to bless us all, we say thank you and amen. amen.
And join me, please, as we say together our prayer of revelation and illumination. Holy God, help us to see love in all your creation, in your good works, in all your blessed relationships. Hear the prayers of our hearts now as we seek to know the agape love that is your love for us. And now let us proclaim together our very need for the loving spirit of God in our lives. Almighty God, we seek to show love wherever you have shown it. Let us come closer to you by becoming closer to one another. Bless us this day that we will continue to be bound together in love and peace. Well, my friends, hear some good news this morning. What God creates, let no one destroy. The love of our God is boundless and limitless. Let us live and love as God has ordained. Amen. 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 And may the Lord be with you all. all you. Lift up your hearts. Lift up the Lord. And let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. So let us join with the heavenly choir of angels in that unending hymn of praise, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who came down to earth so that we may all know the wonder of God's love. So with thanks and praise, let us once again Proclaim what is the mysterious and miraculous truth of our faith, that Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ is here, and Christ shall come again. Hallelujah. And now let us all say together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed by one of his own friends, he was sharing a meal with his disciples, and during that meal, he took what was just an ordinary piece of bread until he raised it, and he blessed it, and then he broke it. And then he passed it to each and every person there with him, and he told each and every one of them to take and eat. For this now is my body, soon to be broken for you. Later on, during that same supper, he took what was just an ordinary cup of wine until he raised it and blessed it. And then he passed the cup to each and every person there with him, telling them to once again take and drink from this cup. For this cup is now the cup of the new covenant, soon to be sealed in the, with the shedding of my blood for you and the forgiveness of sins for all people across all time. And he told them that every time that you do this, every time that you share in this meal together, remember me. Holy and almighty God, we do remember. And that, was, that is what allows us to come to this table this morning asking for your blessing once more that you should turn these simple elements of your creation, bread and grape, into our spiritual nourishment so that we may be filled with a sense of your grace, your mercy, your love that will allow us to go out into this world and to share it with all of those 
whom we meet in our lives. Bless us this day, O Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. My friends, we remind ourselves each and every week that we do celebrate an open communion table here at St. Jude's as in every metropolitan community church across the entire globe. For we recognize that there are no laws, no rules, no requirements for you to come and receive these gifts now blessed by God for all of God's children. These are yours. We simply ask that you do come and come just as you are.
presence is felt here this morning. Amen. Thank you for blessing us anew this day. Thank you for calling us as your own. Continue to bless us as we leave this holy place. We thank you for what we have received this morning. In Christ's holy name, amen. amen. Now, if you would help me sing our closing song, it's number 508. <laughs> friends, as you leave this holy place and go out into the holy world, know that you are loved. You were built for love. So share some of that love, okay? Amen. Amen. Amen.